I'm reading from Sacred Chaos, Reflections on God's Shadow and the Dark Self by Francoise O'Kane. And I'm reading from a chapter of the book entitled The, the Life Ritual. Let me first mention that there's a footnote here in what follows, I am using the contrast cosmos chaos in the sense given to it by Mircea Eliades, the sacred and the profane, i.e. as equivalent to that between profane and sacred. I just want to point out that in Jungian psychology, the term self is also synonymous with the term the God image and with the greater personality. So when you hear the term self, you know what we're talking about. Chapter three, the life ritual. Because the self is endowed with a numinous nature, to relate to it, one must enter into the religious dimensions of being. It is both within and outside the ego, constituting a field of psychic energy and transcending individual life. At a more psychological level, the self knows. It is the archetype that may provide the individual with meaning and a place in the cosmos. This being so, the quest involved in the analytic process naturally involves confronting questions that can only be termed religious even when they are not concerned with theology as such. For this to become clear, we need to think only of the life-death duality as an integral part of the self archetype. The confrontation with death always implies accepting a dimension that transcends consciousness and ego control and that raises the question of the meaning of life. The search for the propitious attitude must therefore take account of a religious axis. At this level, both analysand and analyst need to develop a relationship with the sacred, with the domain that relates to a transcendent power, including all the forms in which this power may manifest. In order to define the means that can serve this confrontation, I shall reflect here on the way some social groups relate to the sacred. In particular, we shall see how they include both its light and dark sides in their perception of the cosmos, and how they develop ritual behavior designed to establish an adequate relationship with ambiguous deities. This type of behavior is most clearly expressed in rites of passage. These concern phases during which the sacred threatens to invade and destroy everyday life. Since the passage involves a change in social order or a modification of personal status, depending on whether the right is collective or individual, there exists parallels between this type of ritual behavior and the manner in which individuals may affect psychic transitions. It thus seems useful to apply models developed by social anthropology to a psychological approach concerning modern individuals. But first, we may view the problem of the ego-self relation from a more directly psychological perspective and ask what means are available to the ego for confronting the self, both in its positive and its negative dimensions. I could, of course, simply comment on Jung's ideas concerning the confrontation with the unconscious. This would include, among other things, a discussion of the transcendent function and of the ways in which it manifests in symbols and in dreams. However, I am interested here in a more specific problem, which may be formulated as follows. Granted that in certain individuals, the self archetype has been unilaterally constellated, that is, that its dark pole overshadows the ego, and that the ego self axis is inadequately developed, that it is unstable, and even that it has been cut. Where does the analytic process intervene to try to help the analysand manage the situation? 
in my experience, work on dreams and personal symbolic material is often not possible at this stage, or it does not help. In despair, the ego is either cut off from the unconscious or overflowed with negative material. It often cannot relate adequately to the symbols and may refuse to be touched emotionally. In this phase, it may thus be of help to use less personal material, encouraging the ego to step back and letting symbols emerge at a more transpersonal level. In the same sense, the whole analytical setting must encourage a passage through chaos, see below, into an imaginary world that is closer to deep layers of the collective unconscious. Through this passage, a bridge will gradually be built, connecting the analysis with a more basically human level. The contact with archetypes may then give back to the individual psyche a sense of being in the world, of being part of a larger cosmos. Later in the process, this emotional experience can be brought closer to consciousness and to an ego that will have rediscovered its connectedness with the self. In other words, in cases where the ego self axis is lacking enough stability for a dialogue between personal conscious and unconscious, the analysis must first help the analysis regress in the sessions to the deeper levels of the collective unconscious where he or she may be nourished and strengthened by the self. This will allow the axis to redevelop progressively and a dialogue between its two poles will become possible, allowing the analysis to confront more personal material. Speaking more generally, individuation may be seen as a movement toward a greater awareness of the self. Through the different stages of life, the ego constantly moves along what may be termed a self-self axis. That is, from a totally unconscious self that preceded the stage in which the ego detached itself, ego-self axis, to a more conscious self, conscious being meant here as aware in an existential sense. However, the movement toward greater self-awareness is not a linear progression. The ego periodically regresses toward the original self in order to bring back more elements from the collective unconscious. It is this movement that I believe analysis must accompany and guide. In every case, but when dark aspects of the psyche are constellated, this return to chaos becomes all the more essential. We shall see below how this return is affected by tribal man, for instance, through ritual and what the corresponding psychic mechanisms may be. Imaginary representations. The title of this chapter, The Life Ritual, was chosen to express the central symbolic meaning in a short story whose motifs symbolize the way the ego may relate adequately to a transcendent dimension of life, to the self. In the story, a specific endeavor allows a moment of life to be created. Here is a summary. Quote, a teacher working for a short time in a countryside school notices that one of her students, a little boy about 10, does not listen to the lessons. He daydreams and spends his free time writing in a copy book, which he refuses to show her. He also won't let her talk to his parents. She is intrigued by the secret he seems to be hiding, but she does not insist on finding out what it is until the day when the boy breaks his leg by falling from a tree. The doctor wants the child to stay in hospital, but he cries. He is in a state of absolute panic and insists he has to go home, declaring that it is a matter of life and death. The boy eventually explains the reason for his upset. His parents were both dead and his only family is his grandfather with whom he lives. Before dying, his father made him promise to take over his own daily task, that is to imagine and tell the grandfather 
every evening a new episode of a story. It is listening to this story that keeps the grandfather alive. And should the child fail only once in his task, the grandfather would die. Up until this day, the boy had conscientiously carried out his duty, despite the isolation involved by his not being able to tell anyone. The teacher promises to take the place of the child if he stays in hospital and invents a new episode for the grandfather, thus keeping him alive for another day. There's a footnote here from a British television series, The Journey to the Unknown. The name of the author is not known, nor is the title that was given in the series. Clearly, the story has a folktale-like character, and indeed, one may find its pattern as a secondary motif in the index of the types of the folktale by A. Arne and S. Thompson. There, a person who is about to be taken away by the devil to whom he or she has sold his or her soul, tries to gain time either by repeating a prayer or a story or by baking bread. A similar motif is found in 1001 Nights. Having witnessed his beloved wife's adulterous behavior, the Sultan Shariar goes mad and kills one maiden after another after they have spent the night with him. Scheherazade, the visitor's daughter, tells him archetypal tales, one every night. She is careful never to finish the story and thus, by sustaining his curiosity, keeps postponing his revenge until the next day. The parallel with our story is clear. Death is being postponed by an act that feeds life at a concrete or an imaginary level. In the Sultan's case, the tales even succeed in progressively healing his murderous impulses. After a thousand and one nights, he finds that he has no longer any need to take revenge. I see the story of the child with his grandfather as symbolizing a manner of approaching the dual nature of the self, of relating to the archetype at all by granting it its proper place in everyday life. In fact, the relationship between child and grandfather, their mutual dependence and the solutions proposed by the narrative leave many questions open, but paradoxically, the use of an image to formulate a fundamental question already contains the germ of an answer. This approach is close to the transformation elaborated by the formulation of a right. Ritual work structures the chaos of being and thus modifies it, rendering it more accessible. As seen from a psychic viewpoint, the daily story imagined by the child and fed to the grandfather plays a specific role. It bridges elements belonging to both the conscious and the unconscious and, at a more general level, to the ego and the self. Its function is akin to that of a ritual. Whether he considers the time spent every day in storytelling as a right or not, the child's imagination brings into the grandfather's life elements that can only be collective or superpersonal. His stories have been told before. He cannot invent anything new. They allow the grandfather to remain connected to humanity in general, transcending his own individual fate. They keep him in touch with that part of the self, which is not only personal. I use the term imaginary representation to express the capacity of such a story to mirror a different reality, and thus to serve as a bridge connecting ego and self. The imaginary world is transpersonal, constituting a fluid, eternal source that transcends individual life. Its images, on the other hand, find an echo in the individual's personal life experience and in the time-bound perception of reality. Of course, the word symbol may also be used in this context. The tale told by the child will contain a succession of symbols, it will both express and impress, 
transforming energy and channeling it into a new form. But I use the other term in order to set it between the profane and the sacred, between linear and nonlinear time, as well as between directed and autistic thinking. What I mean by imaginary representation is the individual's active reception and physical or mental participation in images that are not a product of the ego only. No matter what means are used to do this, the images must be experienced emotionally rather than intellectually. Their energy must touch the ego and provoke an effective reaction that will be a source of change. We shall see, for instance, storytelling may work in a similar way to the way rituals work by guiding the individual through a symbolic liminal period into a new state. Henry Corbin wrote the Mundus Imaginalis, quote, there is a world that is both intermediary and immediate, the world of the image, the Mundus Imaginalis, a world that is ontologically as real as the world of the senses and that of the intellect. This world requires its own faculty of perception, namely imaginative power, a faculty with a cognitive function, a noetic value, which is as real as that of sense perception or intellectual intention." Unquote. James Hillman describes this imaginary world as a means of connecting with the archetypes on the one hand, but also as a bridge toward a world in which the value of symbols results from their providing the individual with a cosmic grounding. In stressing the term imaginary representations and the importance of an active individual formulation of their contents, I am more interested in the pragmatic aspects of analytical work and less in the metaphysical and up to a point socio-political questions raised by Hillman. Let us go back to the child and his grandfather. The story contains two axes, time and imaginative power, and describes how the second works on the first, that is, how the ego may be able to apply the second in order to work on the first. To express this less abstractly, we can say that the child, by adding an episode to the narrative each morning, performs a ritual whose function it is to structure time and to create life. The ritual, made into a tradition by his family, allows a passage from profane personal space to the sake by transforming time creates a moment of life. On the other hand, the story does not mention the possibility of the grandfather living eternally. Should this be the case, the new episode would have to be seen as functioning in a kind of automatic, mechanical manner. The old man would submit passively to his grandson's wish to keep him alive. As I understand it, the grandfather had to be curious enough to want to live until the next episode. He also had to be alive enough, or maybe fed enough by the last episode, to desire another day. Rituals, in fact, act upon linear time, inescapable and quantified, which contains the life-death sequence by feeding on time, which is qualitative, by deriving nourishment from mythical time. After having examined how the duality sacred profane manifests and is confronted in ritual, we shall focus on this dimension, since it constitutes the religious axis along which a genuinely healing analytic approach must orient itself. Since it constitutes the religious axis along which a genuinely healing analytic approach must orient itself. Rites and Rituals. The expression rite de passage has been very much popularized and sometimes applied in a loose manner. It may thus be useful to summarize briefly Van Genop's original description in the Rites of Passage. 
At the core of such rites is a triphasic scheme, separation, liminal phase, and reintegration. This simple notion reveals essential aspects and remains applicable in the case of any ritual ceremony, since Van Gennep was explicitly more interested in describing forms rather than contents. Yet almost every theory of ritual has been influenced by his description. Psychologically speaking, the triphasic scheme corresponds in fact to an archetypal sequence that leading from death through transformation to new life. Page 45. However, the process of transformation may evolve not so much because a death automatically brings about a transformation and a resurrection, but because passages generally can be affected only if a period of marginality takes place. During the liminal phase, a reality that is outside society and culture and outside ego life is experienced. Deep values and emotions are brought into the open, put on a ceremonial stage and expressed in such a way that they may be accepted by the participants. Since this includes both mysterious and frightening elements, Ritual work can be seen as allowing for a modification of negative polarities. During the ritual, the participants surrender their normal mode of perception and action. They scrutinize the values and axioms that have been chosen among vast possibilities to make up their culture and thus come to a better acceptance of them. They also discover new dimensions, ritual as a means of giving shape to something arbitrary, culture, but also of reinforcing it and of providing it with a dynamic aspect by periodically forcing the group to return to its roots. In relation to the sacred and thus to a religious axis, Van Gennep defines rites of passage as magical religious practices aimed at influencing natural events in such a manner that they cease to be dangerous. They are always carried out when a passage between the profane and the sacred worlds must take place, that is, when a transcendent element influences everyday life. According to him, in tribal societies, the sacred characteristically threatens to invade almost every domain of personal and social life. This would explain why these societies carry out so many rituals. One may object to a perspective that implicitly sees tribal groups as less differentiated or less civilized than modern societies. I believe that even in modern societies, the sacred manifests in every domain of life, except, of course, when we repress it because of a belief in the absolute superiority of technology and science or because of a unilateral adherence to rational progress. Our lives are made up of a series of passages, life stages, passage of the days and of the seasons, but especially personal crises and times of psychic anguish. And these passages always provoke an interaction between the sacred and the profane. Most of what happens in ceremonies carried out by groups can be transferred to the individual level since the process in which a cosmos is being created out of a, is being created out of chaos remains basically similar. However, one distinction may be useful. At the level of tribal groups, the term ritual is used to designate a clearly structured ceremony with a specific function. With regard to modern individuals, the movement, profane, sacred, profane, becomes part of a more personal quest and follows a rhythm that is not necessarily dictated by the group. And as far as analysis is concerned, it would be more correct to speak of a ritual-like behavior when referring to the regression to the self that helps the analysis come to terms with a dark pole. Yet both for the group and for the individual, the passage through marginality involves contact with a religious dimension. 
Myth and ritual are closely interrelated. That is, the myths that are particular to a certain tribe are enacted in the ritual. Thus, a given ritual is both a declaration about religion, this is what we believe, and a demonstration of its operation, this is how the gods work. In order to reach its aim, it proceeds in a very specific manner. During the ceremony itself, the threshold people, that is, those going through the liminal phase, are moved outside the social and cultural network, and therefore they escape classification. Their ambiguous and indeterminate position is expressed in a variety of symbols. A brief examination of some of these symbols, together with a description of actual contents found in the marginal phase will provide a better understanding of the mechanisms involved at the group level. By analogy, it will also show what may happen during the phases of the analytic process in which the ego regresses toward the self. The novices are taken away from the village, speak in a secret language, and must respect specific taboos. They may be classified with the spirits of their ancestors and painted black. They return to a cosmic state, letting their hair and nails grow and covering their body in mud and dust. They lose their identity, are robbed of their clothes, and give up the name they had as children. Sometimes they are not allowed to speak, or only in a low voice. Other members of the tribe, Quite often the women are not allowed to see them. They are said to be embryos or babies and must learn to walk, talk, or eat again. The spirits must give birth to their new personality, so they are given a new name. There is a constant coexistence of life and death symbols. The novices may be perceived as androgynous or simultaneously human and animal. They are submitted to painful or frightening tests. This makes them malleable, ready for recreation. During the whole marginal period, they are taught practical skills and esoteric knowledge. The ambiguity of the liminal period is underlined by the presentation of symbols that invert daily reality. The material world is turned upside down. This phase contains elements of playfulness and license. Everything becomes possible. The usual norms do not apply, and behaviors that potentially exist in everyday life may be experimented with. The novice must have confronted the chaos of the sacred to be able to accept the profane. And so the rituals are organized in such a way that, instead of eliminating the dangers inherent to a period of transition, they let these be shown and experienced very concretely. For a brief period, the novice experiences the paradoxes of primeval being, like the Eskimo initiate, contemplating his skeleton, reduced to his own bones. The very foundations of life are systematically put in question. Stimuli and symbols are fired at the individual in such a manner that he cannot defend himself. The novice must live simultaneously in opposite dimensions, experiencing extreme poles of being. He is being shown what is possible while being taught what is approved. It is this sense that the marginal period has a transformative potential. It contains all possibilities, contrasts them, and opposes them to the negation of being that is potentially present in the sacred chaos. However, the sacred is not allowed to manifest in a totally arbitrary or uncontrolled manner. The ritual involves a conscious approach, having predefined its aims. The gods may be working through society as it performs its ritual duties, but the responsibility for the ceremonial acts rests in the hands of each group member. Because actions and consequences are made explicit, the message transmitted acquires validity. The ritual shows the invisible and interprets it through symbolization. It shows the unknown and refers to what the novice knows. 
the ceremony does not end in the border state. The participants look the sacred in the face, but they immediately move back to the profane and integrate to it the elements discovered. There is a dialectical relationship between the two dimensions. Ritual structures the cosmos and guides the individual from a state of passive submission to the group's tradition to a more cognitive acceptance of the sacred basis of culture. By analogy, the periods of psychic marginality, whether sought by the ego or imposed on it by the self, may be seen as providing the individual with a better perception of place within the cosmos and a new interpretation of personal myth. This aspect is especially important to persons with a negative constellation of the self archetype, for they may find meaning only if the dark elements are truly experienced and find a place within the ego's reality. On the other hand, rituals help air and resolve ambiguities and conflicts. At the level of the group, by stating a given perception of the world, they integrate conflicting elements into a coherent worldview, and by attributing a clearly defined position to each individual, they eliminate or channel the structure through power. At the personal level, by helping one move to a less ego-centered perception, a passage through a similar process can help the ego endure tension and conflict and allow the transcendent function to be constellated. Existential questions are then no longer formulated in terms of either or, and paradoxical solutions may be found by the psyche. According to Rudolf Otto's essay on the divine, man always has an ambivalent attitude toward transcendent aspects of life, since the powers involved are both benevolent and nefarious on the one hand, and not easily controlled on the other. The sacred is fundamentally given, both changing and immovable. It remains unquestionable and unfathomable. It precedes humanity and contains us. It is only when societies elaborate a religious system and confront the transcendence of the sacred that it starts losing some of its ambivalent nature. Religions, by postulating an order, provide us with a basis from which we attempt to cope with the unfathomable. They establish causes and relationships with respect to which prescribed gestures or practices are believed to provoke certain consequences. The parallels with what happens at the psychic level in the relationship between the ego and the self are obvious. The self is given, is unquestionable and unfathomable, and it manifests an ambiguous nature, both benevolent and nefarious. Further, far from being only an ordering principle, the self, like the sacred, is related to chaos. It pertains to nature and to the origins of humanity. It is a powerful entity which thinking and reason cannot simply structure and explain. The contrast between profane and sacred may also be seen as a contrast between order and chaos. But this does not necessarily imply a separation of order from chaos. Profane order remains part of a greater sacred whole. It is a modified form of chaos, and the uncontrollable, unstructured sacred may at any time invade daily life and upset the control exerted by individuals. In a similar way, the ego is contained and related to the self as a transcendent entity that may interfere with the control exerted by the ego. However, by discovering an adequate way of relating to the self, the ego may find a way of coping and remaining in touch with a dimension that gives the psyche a place within the chaos. The footnote here is, I guess this is Rudolf Otto's book, The Idea of the Holy, an Inquiry into the Non-Rational Factor in the Idea of the Divine and its Relation to the Rational. Van Genop writes that the sacred periodically pivots on its own axis, that is, 
whenever everyday structures are being changed, whenever a passage to another life stage needs to take place, one comes face to face with chaos. The sacred may invade the profane at any time. Any individual may be thrown back into a primeval chaotic state, which both contrasts with everyday life and transcends it, thus also broadening it. Psychologically speaking, this phase must be seen as an opportunity for the ego to find a better grounding and to relate differently to the dark aspects in the unconscious. This ethnological digression may already have taken us too far from our topic, but there are striking parallels between the manner in which a tribal group finds the means to survive in a threatening cosmos and the way in which Jung sees the individual attempting to confront fate and move along the path of individuation. With regard to the confrontation with dark aspects in the self, the marginal period involves these aspects to a very great extent, and the novice must experience their power in an extreme form before being able to move on to the new stage. This dimension is particularly clear in shamanistic rituals. There, the novice must explicitly experience death, destruction, and chaos. It is probably no coincidence that over the past few years, so-called civilized people have rediscovered the form of initiation offered by such rituals. Indian medicine men are brought to Europe since Siberian shamans are not available. Why this fascination? One possible answer may be found in the way our societies repress darkness. Some individuals instinctively feel a need to compensate for this tendency and to experience the other pole in a dramatic manner. However questionable the organized mimicry of alien culture forms. The life ritual story recounted earlier in this chapter does not describe the manner in which the rite is carried out, except to say that the child has to narrate a new episode every day. On the other hand, his stories are not specifically connected to the dark, but to the self in all its aspects. Yet he does accomplish a ritual act dictated by a family tradition repetitive and endowed with a specific function. In order to continue to live, the grandfather must be fed by his grandson's stories. If I imagine the scene taking place every night, I see it as surrounded by a serious ceremonial atmosphere. It is not a sad event, but one in which both participants are aware of the importance of the moment. Sacred time and psychic reality. Eugene Bloiler defined a form of thinking that he termed autistic undiscipline or non-objectivating, and of which he wrote that it tends not to adapt to reality and that it follows the logic of feelings. Later he added, quote, among other things, it also serves to fill those gaps in our knowledge that we perceive as frightening. It uses symbolism and drama in order to help us confront our inner conflicts and thus helps us toward a greater inner maturity and harmony. Euler's original distinction was reformulated by Jung in his description of two kinds of thinking, directed and adaptive or subjective, actuated by inner motives. In Jung's view, the latter is neither infantile nor pathological. As Bloiler suggested, its archaic nature is directly related to the oldest layers of the human mind, long buried beneath the threshold of consciousness. By analogy, the differentiation may serve to define more precisely the characteristics of profane and sacred time. In more than one way, sacred time is situated within the realm of autism. It follows its own illogical and subjective paths and is related to the transcendent and the beyond, whereas profane time is linear, containing its own beginning and end. The god Kronos clearly symbolizes the duality of time, directed, autistic, linear, random, 
profane, sacred. When he is represented with four wings, two of which are outspread as if he were about to take flight, while two are lowered as if he were resting, the two pairs of wings symbolize the passage of time on the one hand and the ecstasy of transport beyond time on the other. They symbolize the contrast between the continuity of past, present, and future, and the simultaneity of the eternal. The second phase of Kronos is sometimes depicted with four eyes, two in front and two behind, thus personifies an autistic time that is infinite with no beginning, end, or direction. It symbolizes a dimension of sacred time that can be grasped only in an approximate manner. The kinship between the self and sacred time is fairly obvious. Both have a subjective, unfathomable dimension, and both are subjectively motivated. That is, they follow their own internal logic. Both just are without any reference to norms or value systems situated outside their field. In the self, as we have seen, each component has a value only as it is assigned by the ego and not intrinsically. As for sacred time, it precedes and stands beyond any linearity and thus any kind of hierarchy. Mercea Eliade in Myth of the Eternal Return writes of the Ilid Tempest, the that time of the beginning of the cosmos, when everything was being created and through which everything will be recreated. He adds that as societies move toward more consciousness, they tend to attribute a more historical, more linear dimension to time and to move away from the initial time, from the mythical beginnings of the creation. Profane time would thus be historical, while sacred time is ahistorical. For Eliade, rituals help the group reconnect with the totality, with the wholeness of the Ilid Tempest. They could thus be seen as an attempt at participating, be it only for a limited time, in the original unconscious within which thinking and experience surrender directedness in order to be nourished by images and autistic motifs. Put otherwise, rituals are a means of contacting the divine child, one's initial terminal creature. The contact with sacred time and its images also provides the individual with the means to participate in a superpersonal, eternal psyche. This participation, this eternal return through ritual to mythical origins, provides us with the knowledge that we are not alone. It thus allows us to face the dark aspects of the sacred and of the self without suffering more than necessary and without the pain provoked by isolation. We are supported by the awareness that many others have had this experience. Let us go back to our fantastic story as an image of the way in which a return to the illid tempest may be affected and may bring about a renewal of life. Because the child imagines, in the strongest sense of the word, the grandfather is able to reach past linear biological time and to connect with the whole man, feeding on a transcendent dimension. Intrapsychologically, since the two figures must be seen as two aspects of the same psyche, a vital element, the child, and an active commitment in which the daily episode as an imaginary representation allows for a connection with the sacred, make it possible for the whole psyche to live along a religious axis that transcends the individual level of the linearity of time. Chronos simultaneously shows his two faces. The child and the grandfather spend most days in a linear reality, but each also works at maintaining a contact with the sacred dimension of time. They are thus both able to feed from the original wholeness and to find a place in the cosmos. Of course, the contrast between profane and sacred times may also be seen as a contrast between the conscious and the unconscious. We would then have three not equivalent pairs, directed, 
artistic thinking, conscious, unconscious, and profane, sacred. My basic hypothesis is as follows. By resting at the junction of each of these pairs, ritual work, this term being applied here both to traditional ceremonies and to a regression along the ego self axis, makes it possible to overcome their qualities or rather to situate them within an equilibrium that is otherwise threatened by the tendency to dichotomize and to attribute primacy to logical thinking, to technology, and to the Logos version of progress. I have used the expression imaginary representations to designate those aspects of the ritual work that may support a healing. In terms of Jungian psychology, they include the contents of the personal and collective unconscious, dreams and their symbols, folktales and myths, etc. Technically speaking, they may be accessed by a form of active imagination, representation. At a more basic level, they can be understood as a function of feeling and of affective needs, as in Boiler's autistic thinking. It may be that we are no longer fluent enough in speaking and corresponding language. We have lost contact with the form of thinking and with the symbolic aspect of daily events. Instead, we tend to use clever, clear formulations to describe and rationalize our cosmos. Yet, in order to remain connected with the religious axis discussed above, we must be able to relate to the half-light of images that express more than they say. I sometimes feel that too much value is being attributed to the light of consciousness, at least as far as the analytic process and its existential dimension goes. Theorizing is one thing, relating to the unconscious and understanding the language of the psyche is quite another. Jung was searching for an equilibrium between conscious and unconscious, or even was pleading for a reevaluation of the unconscious. It seems to me that it is dangerous to put too much stress on aims such as broadening consciousness, for this risk telling dreams what they mean rather than listening to their message and watching the ego's emotional reaction. What is more, we analysts sometimes create an artificial border between conscious and unconscious by isolating the symbolic material that crosses our path by treating it within a closed system of interpretation. In other words, we may paradoxically dichotomize too much the pair conscious-unconscious. Further, I believe that we tend to concentrate too much on explaining and interpreting as if this were the ultimate aim of analysis, while the need of an analysand may be just as much to reconnect with the marginal characteristics of the sacred and the unconscious. We need models for thinking about the analytic process and structuring it. However, what happens within the process must be of an emotional and existential nature, and at this level, explanations and models are useless. What is more likely to bring healing is a transference countertransference relationship, allowing the analysis ego to connect with psychic reality, and in particular with the original chaos in which one's individual cosmos may be re-anchored. This vital process cannot be contained within a rational vocabulary. Its verbalization may even inhibit the emotional reaction that are essential both to the transference countertransference and to the passage through a marginal phase outside the ego world. Michael Fordham writes that archetypal reactions form the basis of the analytic technique Archetypes, in a Jungian sense, are obviously an integral component of the sacred time that renews the profane, and of Hillman's Mundus Imaginalis. Fordham's archetypal reactions are thus a means of contacting and relating to this time in both its friendly and nefarious dimensions. The sharing of the transference-countertransference relationship 
provides the analytic process with a liminal dimension, and this is particularly important with regard to the confrontation with the dark self. Under the analyst's guidance, the analysand can pass from a personal to a transpersonal level, away from a feeling of being isolated and into a more generally human experience. Instead of being a prisoner to the contrast between his or her own suffering and the norms of happiness defined by society, the analysand is able to return safely to the very source of his human sorrow to the dark and threatening dimensions of being. If we accept that marginality allows the rites of passage to achieve their aim, then we should be prepared to accept that healing will, of necessity, involve marginality. Healing thus involves the reversal of profane reality and the return to another time characteristic of that phase. Moving away from the profane implies moving away from its norms and from a collective ego perception of reality. It is so wrong then to postulate that it is by deliberately swimming against the current, by refusing to be influenced by collective norms of progress and transformation, that the individual may be healed. It is by accepting the dark, the ugly, the sick, that we may succeed in being faithful to the true nature of the soul. And we need to accept chaos so as to maintain a contact with the sacred, and thus with the religious access indispensable to a healthy psychic vitality. More generally speaking, a passage through the liminal aspects of the unconscious provides an experience that is essential to individuation. According to Jung, the individual stands between the conscious and the unconscious part of the collective psyche. Individuation should not be taken to mean only becoming more oneself and going, so to speak, against the collective. It also involves fulfilling a function within that collective, finding a place there. Quote, every mental or moral individuality differs from all the others and yet is so constituted as to render every man equal to other men. Every living being that is able to develop itself individually without constraint will best realize by the very perfection of its individuality, the ideal type of its species, and by the same token will achieve a collective value, unquote. As we have seen, the function of rights is not only to make the sacred chaos less dangerous or less painful, Ritual action is also a search for the nourishment and renewal provided by the superpersonal wisdom of the sacred world. This element is clearly shown, for instance, in the biblical story of Jonah's journey in the whale. He cuts the whale's heart and eats it. At this level, marginality may be closely related to the manifestation of the transcendent function. A contact with collective experience and with the objective psyche offers elements to be discovered that the profane ego is unable to see. During the marginal phases, by moving away from the tensions resulting from the various norms and alternatives faced by the ego, and by surrendering ego control, the individual allows the psyche to take the lead in so doing, one may discover ways of best realizing the ideal type of its species, that is, of becoming more human. It is always very difficult to escape the value judgments dictated by cultural norms, since culture is mainly unconscious. By referring to ethnological theories, I have tried to escape some of the determinism of my own Western thinking and to situate the problem outside of the dichotomies enforced by Christianity. The elements that have been discussed here as characteristic of the confrontation with sacred time through rituals can be seen as components to a specific attitude toward that dimension of being. In a later chapter, they will be expressed in terms of components in the propitious attitude toward the self and its darkest energies. This attitude, 
by bridging the gap between sacred chaos and profane order may serve to give each individual a place within a cosmos that includes them both, rather than providing one with a certainty about the meaning of life, a certainty that would, after all, be rather fortuitous. Before closing this first theoretical part and moving to a discussion of more pragmatic and symbolic aspects, I cannot resist quoting a beautiful passage from a text by Sheila Mooney. Its images very adequately show what is involved in individuating. Quote, the Ashanti of Africa believed that the creator gave a bit of his spirit to everyone whom he sent to earth, and that with the gift of that bit of spirit, the man's soul was bound up in that man's destiny, what he was to become and to do in the world. What we need to do to fulfill our own destiny as creatures is to be as rich, as total in our unique humanness as a tree in its treeness. Yet one further step is needed from us, which the tree does not have to take, for the tree has not lost itself, since from the beginning it has been humbly obedient to its particularity. Not so with us. We have become confused in the cerebral labyrinth of whence and whither. We have sought to be more than human. That is our greatness, but have insisted on our own definitions of how. That is our littleness. If we can but learn, as this myth shows, the simple and hard lesson of emergence, of going into the darker places to follow the restless longing upward, of letting no small thing stay forgotten and of honor, then we shall be related to the unconscious powers within us of life and God. This is our redemption. And quote, part two of this book begins with a short quote, which I'm going to read. A person with the beginning gift of the mind must always try to include his heart in his decisions. A man can live out his entire life without ever finding more than what was already within him as his beginning gift. But if he wishes to grow, he must become a seeker and seek for himself the other ways. I also apologize for the herky-jerky nature of the reading because um, I have had an experience in childhood of my mother telling a story to my brother and me especially, but sometimes to my sister every evening. And it was a life-giving experience. And it lasted, I would say, about three years. And I only wish that at that time we had recording devices because uh, the story that she told at that time was truly precious. And at the same time, I'm having memories or thoughts uh, about active imaginations I've done with tan in tandem with others. And uh, I'm thinking about how I could do uh, an active imagination with all of you and as an ongoing story. Uh, that would be quite interesting. Rose says, what is profane? Uh, what is profane is everything that you see, uh, because profane is the physical world. Sacred is the unconscious or the chaos. Um, so, and Info Overdose says, is it fair to say the persona is a product of the ego? Uh, because the ego is what you think you are, and persona is the way you conduct yourself, and you conduct yourself based on what you identify with. Uh, I would say, yes, that 
the persona is the mask that you wear uh, to the outside world. And the way in which Jung sees the individual attempting to confront fate and move along the path of individuation. And at this point, I have a side note in my book, which I'll read to you or explain to you and then read to you. When I went to officer candidate school in the Marine Corps in 1967, much of the Marine Corps was deployed in Vietnam. And on the very first day of training, uh, we were marched out into the training field and there was a captain standing on a platform. And the first words out of his mouth were, Vietnam, gentlemen, is an exceedingly hostile environment. In order to survive in this environment, you will have to be in the best condition of your life. And so that's uh, how the Marine Corps tribe has, has us uh, face chaos, because when you, uh, when you arrive in a deployed location, it is chaos. I'll reread the book again, page 49, what was said there. This ethnological digression may already have taken us too far from our topic, but there are striking parallels between the manner in which a tribal group finds the means to survive in a threatening cosmos and the way in which Jung sees the individual attempting to confront fate and move along the path of individuation. I see it as surrounded by a serious ceremonial atmosphere. It is not a sad event, but one in which both participants are aware of the importance of the moment. I would just uh, add here that um, when I was in the fourth and fifth grade, um, and a couple of years before that, in the second and fifth grade, uh, my mother would tell a story to my brother and I, and sometimes my sister, every night. And she carried this on very much like Shahrazad for um, three or four years. And uh, it was definitely a ritual of the kind that's being discussed here. Or subjective, actuated by inner motives. In Jung's view, the latter is neither infantile nor pathological. As Boiler suggested, its archaic nature is directly related to the oldest layers of the human mind, long buried beneath the threshold of consciousness. By analogy, the differentiation may serve to define more precisely the characteristics of profane and sacred time. And I'll just give an example. Um, if if you're directed thinking, you can expect everything. But if, if somebody throws a bat at you or throws, throws something at your head and you naturally reach up and either protect your face or catch it, um, that is adapted inner thinking that comes from the deepest part of the unconscious. I have in my notes on the side of this page, uh, the Last Supper or the Eucharist. They could thus be seen as an attempt at participating, be it only for a limited time, in the original unconscious within which thinking and experience surrender directedness in order to be nourished by images and autistic motifs. But otherwise, rituals are a means of contacting the divine child, Jung's initial and terminal creature. And I'll just give you the footnote here. The divine child is discussed in Psychology of the Child Archetype, The Archetypes of the Collective Unconscious, Volume 9i, paragraphs 259 and following. And if you're a regular member of this uh, reading group, you can certainly find that reference.
They serve. They serve to give. Sorry, I didn't quite catch that. Could you please repeat it? I do not know why my <laughs> Siri just speaks out, but I will. Let me go back here. <laughs> Good Lord. <laughs> Going to start that chapter there, that paragraph again. We're almost done. This is from, I'm sorry, I can't pronounce this very well, but it's from Himyo Storm, Song of Himyoka. I don't know what the origin of that is. But Anyway, that is my reading, and um, I will just observe that what I've been reading really, in my view, sums up our duality in the United States right now, and it applies to both sides of the duality equally. And so we all need to, we're all, we're all stuck in this marginal place right now which is expressed every night by the three main cable networks. And so I think it's important for all of us to consider that point and try to find out where the balance is appropriately because in the, in, in the end, we're all Americans um, and we have to find the balance between our brethren and sisters and so i'm not going to go into it beyond that but anyway <laughs>